What we're going to do now is we're going to do several examples of how we apply the envelope theorem in economics. We're going to start off by showing that uh, Lagrange multipliers are what we call shadow values or marginal values. So let's uh, start off by uh, writing down our standard maximization problem. Maximize uh, f of x uh, with parameters theta subject to g of x and theta equals b. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a new g function. I'll call it g tilde of x and theta and b. So my new function, g tilde, has an additional variable, an additional parameter in it. And um, we're going to define that to be just g of x theta minus b. So now, let's, uh, let's say and we're also defining then a new decision problem. It's really the same decision problem, but we're writing the parameters just slightly differently. That's going to be to maximize f of x and <laughs> f of x and theta. <laughs> now it's theta and x, but I want to do them in the same the same order they are here. So uh, f of x and theta subject to g tilde of x, and perhaps I should have put a b in here as well. Uh, theta and b uh, equals zero. Because clearly, if this is equal to b, this is equal to zero. And so now, uh, applying uh, our envelope theorem to our new uh, decision problem, we have partial of v with respect to b is equal to partial of f with respect to b minus lambda, where lambda is a Lagrange multiplier for our constraint here, but that would be the same as the Lagrange multiplier for the constraint here. You're going to end up with the same value of lambda, whether you do this or you do this. And then this is lambda times the partial derivative of uh, g tilde with respect to b. And of course, this is, this is zero. b doesn't show up in the objective function. So we have zero minus lambda. And then the partial of g tilde with respect to b um, is, of course, just minus 1. So I have minus 1, and so we have lambda. So just as we've said here, the Lagrange multiplier for our problem is the value of that Lagrange multiplier is the value of the derivative of the value function with respect to the right-hand side. So we call this a shadow value or a marginal value exactly because it tells us how the objective value will change in response to relaxing or tightening the constraint. Relaxing the constraint by moving the b down, let's say, or up. In this case, it would be up. Relaxing the constraint by increasing b. So if we had an additional unit of whatever b is, this tells us how much that would enable us to increase the value of the objective function. So let's now uh, do uh, an example of applying this to, uh, to demand theory, utility, uh, consumer theory. So now let's suppose we have our standard consumer maximization problem where we are maximizing uh, a utility function. 
uh, over, let's say, R L plus subject to a budget constraint. So the budget constraint is just P dot X equals uh, B, let's say, where X is now a vector, an L vector, so it has L components for the, the, uh, the amounts of the different goods that are going to be purchased or consumed, and P is the price vector, and B is the budget. B is the uh, number of dollars, let's say the units here are in dollars, is the number of dollars that the individual is allocating to consumption. Uh, something to notice here is that uh, the parameters actually don't show up in the objective function here. So I'm going to just point that out as something that's worth noting. No theta. The theta here in this problem, theta, our, uh, our parameter here would be the vector of prices and the right-hand side budget number B, but that doesn't show up in the objective function. That's okay doesn't matter. Another way of thinking of this is it's in the objective function, but the objective function is independent of it, doesn't depend on it. So we could write it in there, but it still won't affect the, uh, the value of, the, of utility. Um, so here's our uh, utility maximization problem. And so let's now uh, see that uh, the derivative of the value function, again, with respect to B, the right-hand side, in this case, with respect to the number of dollars that you have. So this tells us how utility level will increase um, in response to additional amount of money. That's going to be, according to this, that's going to be lambda. So that tells us that lambda is the shadow value or marginal value. The, we'll say it's the marginal utility because the objective value is in utility units. The marginal utility of an additional dollar or an additional whatever the units uh, of the right-hand side here are. If this was in thousands of dollars, it would be the additional utility from an additional thousand dollars. This was an additional, if this was in euros, it would be the additional utility from an additional euro and so on. Now, you might be a little concerned here to say, well, hey, are we really interested in uh, utility numbers and utility levels? Well, that's not something I'm going to go into here. And of course, um, there is an arbitrariness to utility levels, to utility functions, but they're not totally arbitrary. The utility function is a representation of an individual's preference ordering or preference or indifference map. So I won't go into that here, but you're going to certainly see that in your first course uh, in microeconomics. Uh, in the fall semester, uh, the first semester of your program. And it turns out that this actually does play a central role in uh, demand theory and consumer theory. Now, let's, uh, let's note uh, that that's a, uh, a, first, uh, a first consequence or result here. But now let's also note that we could and so this isn't coming from what we did up here, because here we took the partial of V with respect to B. Here we're going to look at the partial of V with respect to the other parameters. In this case, it's the parameter PI for the ith price. And what's that going to be? Well, let's, uh, let's uh, carry out our, uh, our uh, envelope theorem here. It says it will be the partial of U with respect to P minus the Lagrange multiplier's value times the utility, the, uh, the, uh, sorry, this is, this should not be U. This should be, this should be the uh, constraint. 
So this would be, and in fact, uh, let me actually write here, let's use a different color for this. Let's call this the expenditure that the consumer uh, has to lay out at the prices P to purchase the bundle of goods X. So this would now be the, and so the constraint is that E of X and P is equal to B. And so this would now be the partial of E with respect to P I. And again, the derivative of the utility function with respect to the parameter here is zero. This is minus lambda. And the derivative of E with respect to PI is the consumption level, what's been purchased. And so I could write this as the consumer's demand function. That is, it's the amount the consumer chooses to purchase at these prices and at this budget times lambda, minus, okay? So as the price increases, the utility decreases by lambda times the amount of x. And you can see why that's so kind of intuitively, because if the price increases and you're consuming x units, then um, since this is the marginal utility of another dollar, you're going to lose as many dollars as it costs to get this, to get the x to, 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 to be purchasing x units. And so it's kind of intuitive that this ought to be the change in utility um, due to a change in price, given that this is the marginal utility of an additional dollar. And so let's do one more thing with this. Let's, um, let's uh, say that as a consequence of this, we have the consumer's demand function, that is going to be minus this partial derivative of the value function with respect to the ith price, the price of this good, divided by lambda. But lambda is the partial of V with respect to B. So that's partial of V with respect to B. And this is referred to as Roy's identity. This plays uh, an important role in demand theory. And there's one more thing that I wanted to point out here, yes. And that is that uh, the V function, which I haven't actually written down, I've only written down the derivatives of the V function, but the V function, the value function, uh, the parameters are P and B, and we refer to this as the indirect utility function. Let me write that in here. which gives us the, the utility level, not as a function of the consumption of the goods, but the utility level, the level of the objective value, as a function of the parameter values, the prices and income. And the indirect utility function actually plays a very much a central role in demand theory, and uh, we can kind of see that in its relation to uh, Roy's identity. Now, we're going to move on to uh, a couple of additional applications of the envelope theorem uh, to microeconomics. But before we do that, just briefly here at the end of the, this little segment, I want to uh, give you an example that you should work out. I'm not going to work out the details, but it's an example that you should work out for yourself now before you move on to the next video. So the example is going to be a simple Utility maximization example.
So we're maximizing this simple Cobb-Douglas utility function, subject, of course, to budget constraint. Say B, so B stands for the budget that the consumer uh, is allocating to this consumption. And let's say we'll assume specific prices. P1, let's say, is $3 and P2 is, let's say, $4. So those two parameters are now fixed, and the only parameter we're leaving free to vary is B. And so you should be able to get that, let's even write that in here, you should get that the consumption as a function of the parameters, but Of course, the price parameters are 3 and 4, but B we're leaving free. That you should get uh, uh, that this is 1 sixth B and X2 hat of 3 and 4 and B, you should find that's 1 eighth times B and lambda which is also a function, by the way, of the parameters. So while we don't usually do this, we do sometimes, and I'm going to put that in here. Lambda depends on the parameters as well, and that is 1 24th times B, if I'm not mistaken. And now, what about the value function, which, as we said, is the indirect utility function? Let's put that down here. That's the value function at 3, 4, and B. And that, of course, is just the utility value, the utility function evaluated at the optimal solution. So that's just 1 sixth B times 1 eighth B, which is 1 48th B squared. So this is 1 48th of B squared. Therefore, the partial of V with respect to B, well, we know from what we just did over here that the Lagrange multiplier's value gives us this. So this had better be 1 24th times B. And indeed, you see that it is. B squared, take the derivative, I get 1 24th and 1 24th times B. So indeed, whether we do this by getting lambda, or we do this by getting the value function and its derivative, we do confirm, I guess you could say, or this is consistent with the uh, derivative of the value function being the Lagrange multiplier's value. Again, remember, that's at specific values of the parameters and uh, and so that would be at specifically 3, 4, and B. If we change the prices or the B, we're going to get different numbers for lambda and therefore for the value function and for the, for the uh, derivative. Um, and uh, you could do this, for example, you might try this for B equals $12 because that divides into 24 real easily. You're going to get lambda. In fact, we'll just put that in here. B equals $12, you're clearly going to get X1 equals 2, X2 equals uh, 3 halves, and lambda is equal to a half. You could do this for B equals 24, or B equals uh, 120. Uh, you could do this for any, well, you can do it for any, <laughs> any B, but I suggest doing it for values of B that divide into 24 fairly easily. You can use B equals 8, so that's a third. Uh, you should work this out, uh, get the first order conditions, uh, compare them to this for, for this before moving on to the next video because that will really, I think, solidify your understanding of what we just did over here, showing that the uh, derivative of the value function is given by the value of the Lagrange multiplier. So now we'll take all this off and we will move to a couple of other uh, applications of the envelope theorem to some results in microeconomics.